Hello everyone, welcome to University Covenant Church, and my name is David, and I'm so glad you've joined us. We're so excited you are joining us today as we are continuing through the Book of Romans. But before we get into our service, here are a few announcements about what's going on in our church. First, we are excited to invite you to our Ash Wednesday service. Ash Wednesday begins the 40-day season of Lent, a time of personal confession, reflection, and meditation leading up to the joy of Easter. You are invited to join in celebrating the beginning of this annual journey. Service is Wednesday, March 2nd from 7 to 8 p.m. No child care is provided, but kids are more than welcome to join the service. If you're interested, contact Tiffany for more information. Also, we invite you to our Newcomers Lunch at UCC. If you've been new any time in the last couple of years, or maybe you're back at UCC after being gone for a while, we would love to host you for lunch. Join us on the patio at UCC at 1230 on Sunday, March the 6th to meet other newcomers, some of our staff, and to just enjoy a great time of fellowship. If you could, RSVP at ucov.com slash newcomers lunch, so we're sure to have enough food. Finally, next Sunday, February 27th, we have a special service we're calling Worship Together Sunday, where we'll have everyone stay through our services from kids all the way through to the adults. Pastor Bronwyn will be teaching a message and we'll have several people in our church helping her through the service. We also will be having a special appearance from our kids' choir. So make sure you and your family come ready to worship together with our church family. If you're watching our church service for the first time, we would love to welcome and connect with you. Since you're watching with our online family, the best way to hear from you is if you would text the word hello to the number on your screen so that we can welcome you, know your name, learn your story, and discover how we can best support you. We will also arrange with you to deliver a first-time guest bag. As the body of Christ, we love to share in praise and prayer. So if you would like to share a praise for something God has done in your life, or have a prayer request you would like to share with our prayer team, simply go to ucov.com prayer. Write out a prayer request and our prayer team will pray for you. Now, if you would join me in a time of prayer for the rest of our service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we just come before you today, wherever we may be, we know that we are uh, coming in holding different things. Some things may be heavy, some things may be light, but whatever it is, Lord, we know that you are with us. And Lord, we just pray that we would be able to humbly submit before you whatever it is that you would like to do in our lives. And so, Lord, we again just thank you for the opportunity to be a church family. We know we're not owed anything and all of this is a gift. And so we thank you, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Tiffany. Wherever you're watching our service from today, I just invite you to worship with us. Set everything aside that's distracting you. Let's focus on God, and let's praise him and who he is.
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. that with us, come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Hey, University Covenant Church, I'm so excited about today's passage in Romans chapter 12. I hope you're doing well. I hope during the season you're, uh, you're not only hanging in there, but God is helping you thrive as well. And even if you're not, we're with you. We're in this together. We're just so grateful for you all. Jesus tells a really interesting story. It's perhaps one of my more favorite stories. He shares a story about a guy who, owe, who owes trillions of dollars to a king. Uh, the amount that Jesus describes that this guy owes is so outrageous. It's clear that Jesus is exaggerating because no one could ever get into that much debt. Well, it says that this king said, hey, it's time to pay back the debt. And this guy came to the king and he pleaded with the king to have mercy. Give me more time. I will pay you back. Which if you and I were there, we'd just start laughing. Like, dude, there's no way you can pay this guy back. You are in so much debt. But this guy is pleading and pleading and pleading. And it says that Jesus in his story, it says the king had mercy on him and canceled all his debt, like everything, all the years of accruing debt, all the years of stress, all the years of irresponsible behavior, all the years of tragedy and survival, all those, the king said, you're free. You don't have to do that anymore. You are done. And you would think the story would end right there because it just shows what God has done for us, that we have accrued so much unrighteous debt with God. And yet in his mercy for us, he decides to cancel the debt and give us his righteousness. But Jesus doesn't end the story there. He has a second part. And the second part relates to what we're going to be talking about today. In the second part, the same servant that was uh, forgiven all this debt now meets up with someone who owes him money. And Jesus makes it clear the amount of money this guy owes him is pennies. It's half a penny. It's, it's so meager and minuscule compared to what he owed his king. And the scene kind of replays. The guy who owes this guy money says, have mercy on me. Give me more time. I'll pay back the debt. And the shocking part of the story is this guy who's just forgiven trillions of dollars looks at the guy and says, no way, no way. And he sends him to jail until he can pay back the debt. Jesus continues the story and says, when the king found out, he was furious. Wouldn't you be furious? I mean, if you were so compassionate and kind to someone, wouldn't you expect that that person would receive that and give it to others? This is what Paul's going to be talking about today. See, he's going to be talking about the word love. Now, love is a, 
overuse word so much that we miss its meaning. And, and in the Greek, there's different uh, words to describe love. Love. The word we're going to be talking about now is the word agape love. You might have heard of this. It's this unconditional love. It's this love that's based more on the giver than it is on the receiver. In other words, the receiver doesn't need to do anything to earn this love. This love is actually more of a product of the character of the person who's giving the love. And the word love has been used in the book of Romans several times so far, this word agape. Let me just read a few of these verses. In Romans 5.5, 5, it says, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love, his agape love, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. A few verses later, uh, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another one, Romans 8, 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Can anything separate us? In Romans 8, 39, neither height nor depth nor anything in all else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's what I want you to catch in the book of Romans. This word agape, this unconditional love, has been used several times in the book of Romans. But thus far, it's only applied to God's love for us. Only applied to God's love for us. But Paul right now is transitioning in this chapter, Romans chapter 12, and he is now asking us to demonstrate that same kind of love to one another. Here's the picture. If God has been so generous with us, if he's forgiven our sins, if he's cleansed us from all wrong, if he died on the cross for us, if he's given us his righteousness, if he has been merciful and merciful and merciful, and our hand is up out to God and we are receiving that kind of love, now God is saying, I want you to extend another hand and everything I'm receiving, everything you're receiving from me, says God, I want you to dish that out to other people. Now, God is not saying, go be this way, just do it. He's saying, no, it's a direct reflection of what he is doing for us. This is what makes the Christian community so different and so radical. We aren't choosing to love each other out of our own goodness because our own goodness runs out. What it is instead is God is saying, open your heart up to me. Let me bless you. Let me forgive you. Let me show you mercy. Let me agape love you. And as you receive that and your heart becomes full, I am now asking you to demonstrate that same kind of love to one another. Now, in this particular case, Paul is focusing on the church or the family of believers. We'll get into how we love those outside of the family, but right now in this section of Romans, the focus is really our love for one another as followers of Jesus. And Paul's big thing here is, in light of all I've written about what God has done for you, can you please live a life that allows you to do the same for others? So let's take a look. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Verse 9 says, love, this is this agape love, must be sincere. What Paul is saying here is when we're talking about love here, we're not talking about just a feeling. We're not just talking about an idea. This kind of love has to have hands and feet to it. It has to be the real thing. It has to be authentic. Uh, the actual Greek says it has to be without hypocrisy. In other words, when we talk about love in the church, it can't just be something we talk about. It can't just be something we ascribe to with our minds. It actually has to have real practical ramifications. It's got to be real. And this is the first time in the whole book of Romans, now Paul's talking about our love for one another. Up until now, it's all a bit about what God has done for us, his love for us. And now he's transitioning. He says, in light of all that you're receiving, your love for one another, it has to be the real thing. So church, I just want you to know this, that, that, that part of our own discipleship is receiving from God, but not letting it stop there, but learning how to take what we've received from God and look at one another in the family believers and say, now God is asking me to distribute what I've been receiving from him to you. So he goes on uh, in verse 10. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Here Paul is just taking this concept and he's expanding and saying this love for one another, it's got to be a priority. And he says in verse 11 what I've been saying, never be lacking in zeal, but 
but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. His idea here is the only way we're going to love each other in a radical way is if we keep our line open with God. Your devotional life, your prayer life, your reading scripture life, your listening to the right things life, your music life, whatever it is, the way you receive from God, Paul's saying you've got to keep that spiritual fervor up because the way we love each other is directly connected to how well we're being loved by God. And if you don't feel loved by God, if you're not in a position where you're receiving that love, your love for your neighbor in the church will dry up. In fact, I would even say, the times I have a hard time loving, the times I have a hard time forgiving somebody, it's often connected to how well I feel forgiven and loved by God. I can't tell you the number of times where uh, maybe someone wronged me or I'm having a hard time uh, loving someone who might come off as irritating. I know you have no one like that in your life. Uh, but in those moments when I'm griping, usually in prayer, God will say, I'm not asking you to love that person more than I've already loved you. I'm not asking you to forgive that person more than what I've already forgiven you for. In light of all I've done for you, John, how can you not love that person? And so it's not that that person necessarily deserves your love. It's not that they've earned your love. What it is, is a direct response to God loving you. And so Paul says, hey, in this whole idea of loving those in the church, you've got to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. I think what Paul is saying here is there's going to be some things that get in the way of your love for other people in the church. The things that you feel like get in the way, you've got to get rid of those things. And there's going to be things that help you love those people in the church. And he says to cling to those kinds of good things. And so, you know, I was, uh, my son ran the marathon uh, here in Sacramento uh, this past uh, a few months ago. And it was my first time ever watching uh, a marathon. And man, I was so, so jazzed. In fact, when it was all over, it was so fun. I saw some people from our church, people I hadn't seen for a while. It was just so fun cheering them on and seeing other people in pain that wasn't me. It was just, it was great. But when it was all over, I was so inspired. And I said to myself, next year, I'm going to run this marathon. I'm going to do everything it takes to do that. And then as time went on, I realized if I'm really going to run this marathon, there's some things I've got to add to my life, and there's some things I've got to take away from my life. And basically, I gave up the dream. <laughs> I basically said, look, it's just not worth it to me. But here's the thing. When I say I want to run a marathon, that's just the idea. But when it becomes sincere, when Paul says love must be sincere, that's when you get serious and say, no, am I really serious about this? And if you become serious about loving those in the church, you've got to understand, what do I need to get rid of where Paul says hate what is evil? And what do I need to cling to? What do I need to put in my life that will encourage me in that direction? In the same way we think about training for a marathon, Paul is saying the same thing is true about your love for one another. There are things that get in the way. There may be things that you listen to or you read that make you demonize people in the church because they think differently than you. You got to get rid of that. There may be things that help you love your neighbor and your church better. Maybe your own devotional life or listening to worship music. You've got to include more of that. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. And he says, and then to be devoted to one another in love. What's interesting is that word devoted is uh, used to describe how parents feel about their children. And he's like, that's what the feel you got to have. This is family right now. And there's got to be a sense of devotion and commitment to those. We've talked about last week, honor one another about your, above yourselves. And again, Paul does say, you've got to keep your zeal for the Lord alive because that is how you're going to love each other well. So then Paul kind of paints this picture of why this love for one another is so important. He talks about how it's really connected to our unconditional receiving of the unconditional love from God. And our love for others isn't based on their behavior per se, but our receiving that love from God and wanting to distribute it to others who may or may not warrant it through their behavior. So now Paul talks about what does this love look like in the church? How do you know you're loving? And he gives two markers I want to talk about, two kind of signs and I don't know if these are the only signs, but these are the signs that Paul focuses on on this chapter. And I think these signs are really good for us. It's a way for you to measure, am I loving well in the church? And let me just say, if you feel like you're not loving well, the answer is not, I'm going to try harder. The answer is, God, help me receive your love more. Because it's so direct, directly connected to your receiving of God's love. So if you're at any point you're hearing this go, oh, that's not me. I want to challenge you. Probably the problem is receiving God's love. And so you want to get rid of things that get in the way of that and cling to things that help you receive God's love.
So the first marker is, do you have a sense of belonging with the church? Do you have a sense of belonging? What I mean by that is not only do you feel like you belong, but you create belonging. In other words, you are an active agent in welcoming people so that people feel like we belong to one another. He says this in verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. What he's basically saying is, look, what people are, what, what things are, when you see things going on in your family, uh, your church family, you want to be joyful with them. When you see affliction around you, you want to be patient with people. When you uh, see people who need prayer, you're praying for them. There's a sense that we're in this together. He goes on in verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Uh, let me skip to verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. There's this sense of that we are sharing with the Lord's people who are in need. If we see someone in need in our church, we're going to ask, how can we help? We're going to practice hospitality with one another. These are The word hospitality literally means to make a friend out of a stranger. To make a friend out of a stranger. And so here's the thing that often gets in the way. Often people go to a church and they say, I don't feel like I belong. And they sit there and they wait until they feel like they belong. Paul is saying, actually, that's not the right attitude. The right attitude is you do belong, so now act like it. Practice hospitality. Be the initiator of these things. Make friends out of strangers. Make sure people feel welcome. When you see someone who could use your help, offer how you could help. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. When people are celebrating the church, celebrate with them. When people are hurting in the church, hurt with them. This is really interesting because Paul is writing to an ethnically diverse church, Jew and Gentile. And let me just tell you, there was a season uh, in this church life where the Jews were uh, kicked out of Rome for a season. And then they came back to Rome, and those who were in the church came back to a church that was once theirs, but now felt more Roman. I think Paul is saying, look, uh, Gentiles, you got to mourn with those who are mourning. This is really hard for them. I want you to feel what they're feeling. Or when there's good news, someone gets a job promotion, or their kids do well, or whatever it is, or you get into a college, uh, there's a sense of we're going to celebrate with you. Why? Because we belong to one another. We are family. It's interesting, an often quoted verse of, uh, from the early church is in Acts chapter 2. And it says that the believers sold their possessions and gave what they had to those who were in need in the church. Sometimes this verse is misquoted and you get this idea that the church was selling all their stuff to be kind of a, uh, to bless their community. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great too. But what happened in the early church is they saw each other's needs and some people were in dire straits financially. And they actually took it upon themselves and said, we're going to sacrifice ourselves so that we can help those in our family. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. So the first sense of are we living out being a church family together is a sense of are we creating a sense of belonging with one another. This is not the time to feel sorry for yourself and say, I don't feel like I belong. This is the time to say, God, help me receive from you the love you have for me. And in spite of what's going on around me, help me be the initiator of this sense of belonging. Help me be a person of hospitality. Help me be a rejoicer and a mourner. Help me take on other people's burdens. And we want to do that for each other as a church. There's another mark, though. It's not just a sense of belonging. It's also a sense of working through difficulty with one another in a, in a whole new healthy way. So belonging and difficulty. What do we do when things get difficult? Let's go to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, there are times in Scripture where um, uh, Jesus and others will talk about how to treat outsiders who are mean to you. This verse is about insiders who are mean to you. This is, how do you treat, treat a whole, uh, your own church member, your own church family, when they are sinning even and not being kind to you? Paul says you've got to step back and do what God did for you. Now, there's so much nuance here. It's not a call to be a doormat. It's not a call to put yourselves in the way of constant abuse. But what God, Paul is saying is that Christ chose to love you and showed your love for you while you were still a sinner, not when you were being kind to him. So what does that mean about how we love one another? It's not dependent on their kindness to us. We've got to still pray for them 
and we bless and do not curse. Now, there's Matthew 18 and all kinds of other scripture we're not going into on how to handle a broken relationship. And I'm not going to get too much into it because next week that's the main focus. And I don't want you to hear this and say, hey, no matter what people do to you, just, just accept it. That's not the thing. There are sometimes where you need to set boundaries. You need to set space. That's totally appropriate. But even with the space and boundaries, you can still pray for those who are hurting you. Choose to bless and not curse them. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. There's this whole sense of how do we live in harmony with one another. Man, this has been a season to test that one out, right? Our church, the church of the capital C, has been divided politically. We've been divided over COVID and mask mandates. And there's no easy answer. And I could probably make a case for whatever you believe and be pretty convincing. But the number one value here is how do we live in harmony with one another? How do we love each other in our differences on things like do we wear masks or not? Do we get vaccinated or not? Do our kids go to school with masks or not? Do we vote right or left? How do we get along in these things? What Paul says is the value is live in harmony with one another and do not be proud, but we're willing to associate with people of low position. I think he's talking about class and economics here, but I think it's even uh, however you judge people. What, you vote that way? Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people like that. What you believe that about, you name it, do not be proud, be willing to associate, do not be conceited. This kind of community is so much easier to talk about than to live out. And I see that for myself as well. I have super strong opinions, probably you do too. I have strong beliefs, probably you do too. What's crazy about this is that God loved us while we were still sinners. God showed his mercy on us when we were undeserving. And Paul is saying, look, in light of all that God has done, how can we not do the same for for others? Paul's saying, don't be like that servant in the parable. Don't be someone who has been so blessed by God and then holds things over your fellow brother or sister. It just doesn't make sense. And so really this passage that we're reading is about how we treat one another, but I actually think as I've been praying over this, this passage is much more about receiving God's love for you. What is it that helps you most understand God's love for you? What is it that most helps you experience God's love for you? For some of you, it's prayer time. For some of you, it's worship music. Some of you, it's scripture. Some of you, it's nature. Some of you, it's worship services. Some of you, it's small group. It's going to be diverse, but I think what I want to challenge you, church, is to continue to put yourself in places where you become of God's love for you on a regular basis. I was just talking to someone in our church who she has a discipline of every morning she has a short devotional and every evening before she goes to bed, she has a short devotional. That helps her so much. I know some of you where it's, man, it's music, just listening to worship music or songs about God that remind you. Some of you are academic types who are just getting into God's word and the richness of that remind you of God's love for you. Some of you are socialites where it's like, man, I just love being around my small group and community. And when I'm around other people, it reminds me of God's love. I have found in my own life, I love people better when I experience God's love of me. And when I dry out, when I'm more bitter, when I'm more resentful, when I'm just tired, it has a lot more to do with my relationship with God in that moment than the other person. So here's my challenge. Receive God's mercy. Receive it. Receive it. He is generous beyond belief. And don't be that servant that then is petty, holds petty debts with, or gets, gets on the other person. Rather be a servant that says, in light of what I've been forgiven for, how can I not be kind to you? Now, there's a theory in that parable, we don't know, that this servant who was forgiven by the king billions and trillions of dollars may have not believed the king. There's a theory that maybe the reason he wanted money from the guy who owed him money is he was still going to try to pay back that king. We don't know for sure. But it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me that might be the case because I think if you don't really believe you've been loved by God and forgiven by him, you're going to have a hard time releasing other people. So I think we need to believe that God truly, truly loves us. But will you dream with me just for a moment? Will you dream with me? Can you imagine just for a moment that we live lives where we are constantly putting ourselves in the awareness of God's love for us, that agape love? 
and we seek to do that for one another. Can you imagine being in a community like that? Where, man, if I blow it, you are gracious to me, and we exchange forgiveness, because we know that God's done that for us. That when you're hurting, one of us comes along and says, we hurt with you. That when you're rejoicing, you have people who are coming along saying, we are celebrating with you. That when you hit a financial need, we have a church that says, we're here with you. Can you imagine being in a kind of community where we actually have a deep sense of belonging to one another? The kind of community that in the midst of difficulty, we love each other in a countercultural way. I think that's why Jesus says, people will know you're my followers by your love for one another. This agape love, it's kind of radical. It's kind of unheard of. It's kind of something that we'll never maybe 100% get to, but as we continue to put ourselves in place of God's love, we continue to try to strive in that direction. That's the kind of community God wants for me and you. And Paul is saying, man, brothers and sisters, in light of all that God has done for us, how can we not be the same for others? Now, I just want to say, in case people hear this wrong, there are ways to talk to believers who have hurt you. There are ways to have great reconciliation. And we're not getting into all that, but read Matthew 18. Read scriptures of how we forgive one another in life, how God has forgiven us. But what I want to emphasize here is the principle here, the goal, that we're called to love each other well, to create a family of belonging and hospitality, and to work through difficulty well with one another. God bless you guys.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Before we go, I just want to remind you, if you're new here and want to connect with us, you can text hello to the number on your screen. We want to be able to support you and welcome you into our family. Also, we want to say thank you to everyone who gives regularly to UCC. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver understands there is a connection between spiritual growth and generosity. That giving in it and of itself is a blessing and your giving has been such a blessing to our church in this season. So we also want to say thank you for giving. If you want to learn more about giving to UCC today, simply text GIVE to the number on your screen. And if you haven't done so, you can also automate your giving on our website at ucov.com give. Thanks again for being with us here today online, and we hope to see you next week as we continue our series through the book of Romans. Now receive this benediction. University Covenant Church, go now into the world inspired by the extravagant love of God. Live generously with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do. Go in peace.